Professor Stella is going to talk about black holes in higher derivative gravity. So please, your stage. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to talk on this. this is a rather nice conference. And uh, I wanna tell you about work that's been going on, uh, I've been involved in over a rather long period. The uh, more recent work <coughs> is uh, was mainly in collaboration with uh, uh, Alan Perkins, my student, and Hong Lu and uh, Chris Pope. Uh, but <clears throat> we'll also, at the end, I may uh, make some reference also to work of uh, Alfio Banani, Banano and, <clears throat> and uh, Silver Valley, uh, Samuele Silver Valley. So um, if we, let's see now I can start. Right, okay, let's begin with this um, basic action that lots of people talk about um, and its field equations. And um, so the rather complicated set of field equations, which uh, I'm not going to dwell on, I, for the sake of this purpose, a little a short time, I put in a test stress tensor also that we can talk about briefly. And um, as I guess has often been remarked upon today, this, the, um, if you expand this action around flat space, you deduce the dynamical content, which contains positive energy massless spin two, but negative energy massive spin two with the mass given in terms of the, the gamma coefficient of R and <clears throat> the alpha coefficient of the vial squared term and a spin zero mass as well, uh, which has however positive energy and that's very much related to uh, Alexei Starobinsky's uh, version of, of inflation. So um, <clears throat> now what I want to talk about mainly today are static and spherically symmetric solutions. Um, rather complicated field equations, but we're going to try to do the best we can in, uh, in understanding what their structure is. So um, let's work first of all in uh, traditional short shield coordinates for which uh, the metric is given uh, in that fashion with coefficients b and a. And uh, to study it first of all, let's look at the linearized theory <coughs> where um, there are going to be six integration constants. Basically you see one over r um, behavior it's the usual Newtonian type behavior at, at uh, infinity. And then a series of Yukawa terms and associated terms, the uh, exponentials, but they're rising and falling exponentials, of course. And um, we're going to want to impose boundary conditions that kill the rising exponentials if we talk about asymptotically flat uh, solutions at infinity. So they're rising and falling exponentials for both the, the massive spin two and massive spin zero uh, uh, exchange particles. Um, Okay, so now um, just a brief comment on the linearized uh, uh, theory that the, you, if you put in a, a, a stress tensor, so for example, I've put in this stress tensor T mu nu, which is just a mass point, you get, um, a, 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 you fix the, the coefficients that I showed you on the uh, previous slide. And if we're looking for asymptotically flat solutions, um, you're going to determine the values of the coefficients, uh, which are, are given here. Now, as I think Breno Giacchini uh, mentioned, um, one finds in this case that the, if you actually look at the sum of these coefficients, one eighth minus a 12th plus a 20, minus 24th, in fact, they, uh, they add up, to the, the singularities add up to zero. So um, that <clears throat> of course is uh, intriguing about the Newtonian limit. Um, it looks like it removes the singularities of the theory. However, uh, we believe that this is uh, illusory because uh, for, for two reasons. One is that you'll find actually that the, the solutions still have curvature singularities, but also this behavior of the apparent Newtonian potential um, is going to vanish when you look at the full nonlinear theory. Another thing I'd mentioned is that in order to get this cancellation, even at the Newtonian level, you have to have all the terms. You can't just uh, decide to get rid of say the scalar part because uh, that up upsets the, uh, the cancellation of the coefficients. Okay, well, now, instead of uh, looking at that linearized uh, solution, what you can do is try to um, follow a Frobenius uh, type of analysis and look at the initial equations for behavior as r tends to zero. So initially with assuming uh, <clears throat> a, a power law distribution with the uh, integral, integrally uh, shifted powers, um, one can change this, this analysis somewhat, especially when you do this, a similar thing around a horizon but um, for the time being, let's just stick with this. And you find that there are, you learn the behavior of the leading terms. By the way, I put a tilde on the S here because we're gonna to change to, when we talk in particular about uh, Alfio and Samueli's work later on, uh, we're going to, there will be a sign flip with that. 
So um, you make these, uh, this assumption of the behavior of the uh, space and time coefficients, and um, you find the following possibilities. They're families of solutions. So this, by the way, this one minus one solution, that's where, of course, Schwarzschild uh, lives in this, uh, in this fa family of solutions. You can look at that, by the way, just go back to the equations. You see that every term includes a, a Riemann tensor or Riemann Ricci scalar or, or, or uh, Ricci tensor. So if R mu nu equals zero, you have an automatic solution of this, this theory as well, leaving the stress tensor out, of course. Now, um, so <clears throat> we, have, we know that there's, there's definitely one, uh, one known solution here, exactly known, thank goodness, which is good old Schwarzschild. Um, and then you have these other families. The last family, in fact, with six free parameters, you have to work rather hard to, uh, to find the last parameter that shows up at a higher order. And um, a lot of this work has benefited from, <laughs> I started out doing this back in 1978, but um, uh, more recently, of course, we've re-looked at it. In fact, with the power of Mathematica, you can, uh, you can do a more complete job. Okay, so that's the asymptotic analysis. And we're gonna talk about these families as we go, as we go through. Now, um, one family, which in fact, I think Bob Holden is likely to, to talk about later on, is a, a family which I call the 2-2, two, two, that's time to the two and space to the two um, uh, behavior as you approach the origin. And um, you can find this, this has to be looked at, a lot of this has to be looked at uh, numerically. So um, you have these solutions that, that are tending to um, quadratic behavior in both space and time uh, uh, components. And, um, what do they look like further out? So this was studied by Bob Holdham. And also we've, we've studied it. Bob Holdham studied it first of all in a, in a special theory where you set the mass two, the spin two and the spin zero uh, um, excitation masses equal. Uh, but we also found the same thing in the, uh, the R, the, the full theory. Um, so there are some solutions here which look Schwarzschild-like out at as uh, you approach infinity. But, um, and then this dashed line, of course, is the Schwarzschild uh, sequence. And of course, that's where it finds a horizon. But these are, there are solutions here which don't have a horizon and just continue on through. Um, so I want to mention that now. I'm going to come back to that perhaps at the end when I talk about a sort of a, a phase diagram of the solutions of this theory. Um, and I think Bob Holdham is likely to talk about this too. So, there's another class of solutions, which one could call wormholes. Um, these are solutions that can have, of course, the, one of the important things about um, the, the character, if you remember my expansion in terms of, of uh, coefficients at infinity, we have C20 is the one that basically gives the, the ADM mass, but <clears throat> then, and then the, the falling Yukawa coefficient is equally important. Um, <clears throat> so, you, you find, for example, solutions with a negative mass in the uh, R and Weyl squared theory. Um, and it's, um, it's convenient to talk about this instead of in terms of A and B is to flip the sign of A. That's by the way, where the S and S tilde sign flip is gonna come from. Uh, talk about F is one over A. And in such solutions, they reach zero at some point where still the, the time component B is, is not yet zero. So if you, if you look at the asymptotic behavior near this, this point where um, it, the, the uh, uh, f, go, f function uh, uh, goes through zero, make a coordinate change as given here, then you find asymptotically it looks like, looks like this. And uh, in this particular example is, uh, is uh, Z2 symmetric in rho, the new coordinate, and it can be interpreted as it goes through um, this r equals r zero region and into another uh, Z2 symmetric uh, region on the other side with everything less than R0 being excluded from space time. So that's a kind of a wormhole. That's another part of the zoology of, of solutions that you have here. But <clears throat> probably of most interest are the family of solutions which are, uh, which really you could, can call black hole solutions, um, including horizons. So one thing that makes your life a, a lot easier is a, uh, a kind of a no hair theorem uh, which was initially discussed by, by William Nelson. There are some sign errors in parts of his paper, but this, this part of the paper is correct. So we, we also studied it. Um, if you assume asymptotic flatness at infinity, and 
you assume the existence of a horizon, then you can make a rather standard type of no hair uh, discussion and you find that the Ricci scalar has to vanish and that simplifies your life a great deal. Um, the field equations become basically the same as in the case where you don't have the R squared term, so you just have uh, vial squared and R. And now you can go back and count, count parameters similarly to what I was just talking about, but not around the origin, but around the horizon. And subject to this R equals zero condition, uh, you find just three free parameters. Um, now, we know some of those, that's just called short shield. So um, uh, it's characterized by two parameters in short shield. One is the mass, and the other is a rather trivial uh, normalization parameter of the G00 component at infinity. So finding three in the full theory, you see that um, there's actually just one new parameter, which we'll call the non short shield parameter, or NS parameter, that's relevant to this type of solution in the, in the higher derivative theory, relevant to the family of asymptotically flat solutions uh, with the horizon. Okay, so now let's, let's try to study them. So <clears throat> let's suppose we're sitting on a short shield solution and try to move, the, let's turn on this NS parameter and try to move a finite distance away. Now, in general, remember that we were talking about asymptotically flat solutions. So what you expect to happen, of course, is that you upset the behavior at infinity. You turn on those rising Yukawas and you, you violate asymptotic flatness for at least initially small deviations from Schwarzschild. But suppose you then push further and in, in this non-Schwarzschild parameter, is it possible that you come back to a solution that's asymptotically flat where you kill off the, um, the, uh, the rising Yukawas? And this is a problem that you have to study uh, numerically, but at least we have this trace no hair theorem. So R equals zero for such solutions and uh, one of the, the very welcome features of that is that when you study the actual the equations that I gave on the first slide is that now we're in the R and vial squared theory only. And um, thankfully, the equations in that case can be reduced to a system of two second order equations. So you're in much better um, situation for trying to, trying to solve this. So <clears throat> now here again, where I'm going to replace A by one over F. And if you now um, look at the structure of the equations around this place where the uh, F um, function vanishes. So we'll say at some value R zero, you, and you study the field equations, you find that it has to be, um, it, sorry, so if you assume that first of all, the B is, is vanishing linearly in R equals R zero, then you find that F has to vanish at the same value. And now you can make uh, expansions ar around in R, R, R minus R zero and uh, and then you find that the higher parameters for i greater than or equal to two of the h, i, and f, i can be solved for in terms of r0 and f1. So now remember that Schwarzschild has f1 equals one over r0. So it's convenient to parameterize the deviation from Schwarzschild in terms of a parameter like this. So f1 call it as one plus a delta over r0. If delta equals zero, bang, you're on Schwarzschild. And so now that you can you can study numerically. And <clears throat> here's what we found. Um, so we, we need to find values for, of this delta for which, as I say, as you disturb short children generically, you're going to cause the rising exponentials at infinity, but you can look for values of it, which actually bring it back to an asymptotically flat solution. And you find that there actually are such solutions. There are, there's an asymptotically flat family of these uh, non short -shield black holes and it crosses the short shield family to special horizon radius, um, which I'm going to call Arzo Lichnerowitz, which I'll explain uh, further on. And so, for example, for the value alpha, and remember the vial squared co term, gamma equals one for R, uh, one finds the following families of black holes with this red, red dotted line, those are actual calculation results. That's, of course, the short shield family. <clears throat> and this blue line, which is crossing it at a certain point here. Um, is the a family of non Schwarzschild black holes, new solutions that behave like black holes, they have horizons and they're asymptotically flat. It's interesting that this value, the Arzu Lichnerowitz is 0.876. That's a funny number, I was going to come back and I'll, I will make a mention about it later on. Okay, so there are such solutions. And now let's talk a little bit more about uh, the meaning of uh, Lichnerowitz. So, um, <clears throat> This point where the two families cross, 
is, uh, is interesting. And you can study the behavior of, uh, of solutions in that, in that vicinity by starting on the Schwarzschild family and looking at infinitesimal variations of, of the higher derivative equation starting around the Ricci flat Schwarzschild background. So if we um, look at variations of R mu nu, it's a lot easier than looking at var variations, of course, of the metric. So we start from a flat background, R mu nu equals zero, and we look at delta R mu nu, and you end up with this equation that I've written on the slide. Of course, it's still curvature squared and so forth. But um, now we want to remember that we are looking at asymptotically flat solutions with horizons, and there's the trace no hair theorem. So R equals zero, and then that simplifies this, um, the, so the variation of the Ricci scalar is zero. And then the delta R mu nu equation simplifies to this. Again, remembering the mass of the, uh, of the spin two particle. Um, delta L is in fact the Lichnerowitz operator. It's given here, involves the Dallembertian and, the, and, and a term involving the, uh, the, the Riemann curvature. So <clears throat> if you see, you see that if you look and restrict attention to the, again, M2 is a mass of the, this ghost spin two particle. Um, in the, if you look at the non-tachyonic case of that, you see that black hole solutions that are deviating from Schwarzschild have to have a, uh, um, a lambda uh, eigenvalue, which is negative minus M2 squared. So <clears throat> Lichnerowitz eigenvalue for variations of the Ricci tensor which is a negative. Now that actually is a problem that was studied um, a long time ago by, uh, back in 1982 by Gross, Perry and Yaffe in the Euclidianized um, short shield solution, the instability of the thermodynamic instability of that solution in, in pure Einstein theory. And they found there is just one normalizable uh, negative eigenvalue mode of the uh, Lichnerowitz operator for such deviations. And <clears throat> For a Schwarzschild solution of mass m, here is the value, the negative value of lambda. In other words, if I re reinstate <coughs> the uh, the mass, re-express re lambda in terms of m2, we find that this is, uh, and take the square root, we find the product of the mass of the spin two mode of the theory times the mass of, uh, of the Schwarzschild uh, solution should be about 0.438, uh, square root of 0.192 from Gross, Perry, and Yaffe. Now, if we compare this with the numerical results that we found for the new black hole solutions, this corresponds rather nicely to the point precisely where the non-Schwarzschild black hole family crosses the Schwarzschild family. So you can actually explore, thanks to Gross, Perry, and Yaffe, this deviation from Schwarzschild, even though these rather complicated uh, nonlinear field equations allow you to explore the, 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 the neighborhood of this crossing. Okay, now there's another point about this, however, which is that um, there's an instability that one wants to talk about. Um, this is known as the Gregory Laflamme instability. It's actually a spherically symmetric, that's S-wave uh, uh, instability, which was initially found in, this, in the context of five-dimensional black strings, but you find that the mathematics of the instability are, is exactly uh, reproduced in in this theory. This is an analogous instability that exists for low mass short chill black holes, but it disappears above a certain limit, which is given by this. And here's 0.438 show, showing up again. It's precisely the, so the, the mass M2 of the mass, massive spin two mode of the, of the higher derivative theory times this maximum um, uh, uh, limit of the instability then um, you get uh, divided by Planck mass squared, you get 0.438. And indeed, that's exactly the crossing point of the two, two families. That note that this depends rather critically on the presence in the theory of the, of the massive spin two mode. Okay, so let's consider for a bit then the thermodynamic implications for stability. And this, this part of the talk may um, bear some relation to what Xavier uh, Calmet was talking about. Um, so we, if we use um, Bob Wald's formula for entropy, uh, then you can, you can work out the, 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 the <clears throat> um, implications for, um, uh, for example, um, the first law of thermodynamics, dm is, is TDS. And, um, 
And then, so for the family of uh, non-Schwarzschild uh, non black holes, you can obtain the following numerical expansions for relations between mass, temperature, and, uh, and entropy, S being the entropy. And you can then find that um, for, for Schwarzschild itself, of course, you have the classic mass temperature relation. It's uh, the uh, mass is one over eight pi times the temperature. And if you eliminate the entropy for the non-Schwarzschild black holes, then you can obtain a corresponding relation between black hole mass and temperature, both for Schwarzschild and non-Schwarzschild black holes. So we have this sort of picture. The dashed uh, red line is the uh, mass temperature relations for Schwarzschild. And the uh, solid blue line is the uh, mass temperature relation for the non-Schwarzschild solutions. Note that when um, you look at, at a given, given value of mass, for example, the non-Schwarzschild black holes are always at a lower temperature than the Schwarzschild ones. Um, now, except of course, where they kiss, the two curves kiss one another and that's at the Lichnerowitz point. Okay, so you, given those relations, you can also uh, recast it in terms of a free energy discussion. So I take F is M minus TS. And, and now the, uh, <clears throat> the more stable configuration is the lower one, you see. So the, again, the non schwarzschild black holes is the blue line and the Schwarzschild ones are the, the dashed lines. There is this instability, um, <clears throat> Gregory Laflamme type of instability that shows up at uh, at low masses, and you can see this the, the, the crossover of the curves. So there seems to be an exchange of um, thermodynamic behavior uh, at this point, which is in fact, the, the kissing point is, is again also this uh, Lichnerowitz uh, point. So lower free energy corresponds to greater stability. And uh, then there's a, a, a general argument, for example, by Gupser and Mitra, who proposed that there's that uh, thermodynamic and the dynamical instabilities are related, namely that uh, time, de time dependent dynamical instabilities can't occur without a corresponding uh, thermodynamic, misspelled instabilities in the, in the related finite temperature Euclidean theory. And uh, this, of course, has been looked at uh, and proved in the context of axisymmetric black holes by, uh, by Hollands and Wald. So if we assume that the same relation holds between dynamical and thermodynamic instabilities here, and taking into account the known Gregory Laflamme instability for short to black holes below this uh, crossing point, then you obtain a clear suggestion that there's an interchange of stabilities between the short family and the NS family. So one can draw um, this sort of picture for um, the non short black holes, the blue line, the, the dash straight line, of course, mass versus radius for the Schwarzschild family. And the Schwarzschild family becomes unstable below this Lichner of its crossing point. The, the new family would become stable. They're colder. And when, they, when you go above the point, they become hot and <clears throat> they become unstable. Uh, so <clears throat> that is a, a suggested relationship of stability and su suggests that when you, for very low mass Schwarzschild um, it, black holes in this theory, they start to become unstable and they and stability passes over to this other branch. Now, of course, this is an interesting curve. You don't quite know what's happening as you go, the calculation stops about here because you're really interested in you to go down to, to low radii, what it's going to become. And uh, that is something that one has to really study uh, numerically. So um, that's the next topic I want to address. Because of the highly nonlinear behavior of this, um, you need to do a rather careful uh, linking, basically, of what these this um, Frobenius study that I that I told you about at the origin and the linearized behavior for asymptotic flat solutions at infinity. Now, um, so as we recall that for solutions with a horizon, which is what we want to talk about here, um, it's it's sufficient to study just the einstein weyl squared theory. And uh, actually, say this. so this is work basically uh, by Bonanno and Silver Valley. And so um, they also use this, this uh, parameterization for the time, time component, of course, it's B as well, but then they flip over A, so write it as one over F. And then they can make asymptotically flat uh, linearized solutions near the horizon, exactly the same sort of ex expansion that, that I was talking about earlier, except now around R equals R zero. And of course, surface gravity is, is given here, one half uh, square root of F1H1, and the temperature is, uh, 
is kappa over uh, two pi. Now, um, this uh, is characterized uh, at, at uh, the asymptotic flat limit by, by two essential parameters, the ADM mass and this falling um, Yukawa coefficient. I used to call it C2 minus before. S2 minus is, I think it's a factor of two different, that's all. So I kept there. Um, so if you start it for a solution of this form at a large radius, and then numerically integrate inwards towards an intermediate radius for which you do a fit. And then you use shooting message to come out from the horizon. Um, and then you try to match these smoothly. Then you can, you can link what's happening at infinity where it's asymptotically flat into the horizon. And then further on proceed towards R equals zero. Uh, and then compare with the solution families that uh, found by Frobenius analysis down at the origin. So, what, um, they found this is in um, uh, is is the following. Um, they found that there's a changeover in the near origin behavior depending upon the value of the radius of the uh, of the horizon. So they they did it for example with m two equals one, right? Um, black holes with positive mass then exist only for uh, the falling Yukawa greater than minus one point five. Um, if the, uh, the, the falling Yukawa is greater than one, then they're colder than short gel black holes at the same horizon. I've mentioned that already. But if, they're, uh, if S2 minus is, is less than zero, they're hotter. And you have this interesting behavior. You start out, this is, um, so T is, the, is basically the, the uh, uh, sort of Frobenius power of uh, the time component, log, log of B, R, R B by dr log of B, and similarly S, for the uh, f coefficient. And they start out here with basically close to minus one, both of them, this is in this uh, new notation, s is minus s tilde that I had earlier. And as you come into a certain point here, then they separate and in fact, it goes to this um, two two type of behavior, or I think what uh, they call uh, minus two two. So it's, it's going into the sort of uh, solutions in general that, um, Bob Holdham talks about, except that this is a solution with a, with a horizon, whereas Bob Holdham's solutions actually don't have a horizon. So that's basically the point to learn here. Now, you find that there's a switchover in behavior where this happens is about R0 is um, somewhere around 0.86. And that's an interesting number because we've seen something like that before. Well, that it looks like that's exactly the Lichnerowitz crossing point. Um, from there's a, a switchover between the non Schwarzschild hot black holes, which have a behavior similar to Schwarzschild, S and T are minus one and minus one, to the cold minus two, two solutions, which in my earlier notation would have been two, two because it was in terms of A rather than F, um, with a vanishing metric at the horizon. Indeed, this, um, this is, is similar to the, the solutions that Bob Holden studied. But these, his, his solutions were horizonless. And what one finds, if you now look at the general um, sort of phase space behavior of these solutions, but for example, done in my student, Alan Perkins PhD thesis, and also unpublished work of Bonanno and Silver Valley, that the horizon Susan to be found precisely on the boundary between these domains. So I think uh, I'm coming towards the end of this. Let me just um, show you a map that I uh, got from Alfio. Um, on the phases in R, my, R and bio squared gravity. Of course, if you want to include the R squared uh, uh, term, you're going to have to draw three dimensional pictures, which is harder. But you find these families of solutions that I've been talking about, namely type one are solutions which are uh, a sort of short shield type solutions that are singular at the origin. Type two are these um, solutions with vanishing metric at the, at the horizon. And type three are, are wormholes of the sort that I've discussed. There are also, also other families of wormholes where they, instead of using a, 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 a power law behavior assumption with integral changes of power, you can, you can find power laws with, with fractional changes of power as well. Now the solutions with horizons live on the boundaries between these zones, between the various zones type one, two, and three. And the, the Schwarzschild solutions themselves, in fact, um, are lying right on the, this black line along the M axis. So this is sort of the topography of, uh, 
of the, uh, the, the, the solution families. Um, so that in fact, I guess brings me to, um, to the end of what I wanted to tell you, just a, an overview. The, um, this R, vial squared and R squared theory has a richer cla classical uh, static classical solution than, than pure Einstein theory. So we have solutions without a horizon, uh, vacuum solutions, um, uh, worm, wormhole solutions, and also a family of, uh, of the non-Schwarzschild black holes. Um, they cross at this uh, Lichnerovitz point related to the gross perry uh negative eigenvalue mode, as, as I've discussed. And, and there's also this indication that the Schwarzschild solution itself becomes unstable at low masses given by, again, by this uh, Lichnerovitz uh, radius or to mass. And thermodynamic analysis applies, implies that the, the short, non Schwarzschild black holes are stable, in fact, for, uh, so for against these uh, S wave instabilities, at least, stable for solutions with radii below the Lichnerovitz point. So um, I guess that's what uh, I had to, to tell you, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very nice talk. And um, Okay, let's uh, let's open for the question. I see uh, th there was a, a question from from uh, uh, Vikman. Maybe we can start from here, and then uh, uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, hi everyone. Uh, uh, I have a maybe very primitive question. So, if we have ghosts in this high derivative gravity, then probably Hawking radiation would also. Uh, Kind of be built out of this ghosty quanta, right? Uh, maybe just at the last stages of evaporation, maybe not. But uh, what kind of role would they play in the Hawking process, in the evaporation process, or not evaporation? Maybe they increase the mass of the black hole. Is there actually compensation of flow, let's say, of ghosts and uh, normal particles, maybe at some scale? Thanks a lot. Okay, well, I don't have a, a very good, I've been trying to avoid the issue of, of uh, the ghostly nature of the spin two mass because people um, of course have been talking about that quite a lot uh, this week. Um, my attitude towards that is that, and, and uh, again, I think one will immediately get a response from Gia about this, but um, uh -huh. it would be nice if there were a domain of, uh, of energies below which you don't have to worry about the ghost this week. Namely, that um, there's a domain of, of stability essentially against uh, of ghost, ghost production until you get to very high energies. And this, uh, John Donahue had arguments that that happens, for example, in the effective theory. So, and I was treating all of this in this talk just on purely classical, black classical level. Now, and also I was not really taking into account uh, quantum elements of instability. This S wave instability I was talking about was purely classical. So, indeed, I agree that your questions are, are highly relevant. And uh, uh, when it comes to absolute, of course, the quantum instability and evaporation of source um, doesn't necessarily have to be rapid. But that is, again, the topic that there's been a lot of discussion about this week. Uh, in particular, Gia Diwali may have a, a different point of view that um, once you have a ghost, it hits you right away uh, with infinite force. So um, I, uh, I, I don't have a, a clear ideology on that point. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I hope once we can we can continue this discussion with life, like not online. <laughs> Thank yeah. You. I mean, what I can say, I've looked a little bit about the kinematics of, uh, and, and with Richard, we've discussed some of this. Um, the, the simple kinematics of simply uh, uh, a, a Feynman diagram, which evaporates one one ghost particle, in fact, requires that um, that the uh, energy of the incoming particles be at least on the order of the mass of the of the ghost. However, there are higher order Feynman diagrams so the multi-particle multi productions which, which happen at lower energies. And so, ah, okay, now we got into the technical details of um, when you have to worry about your ghosts. Yep, yep. Thanks a lot, okay. thanks a lot. Maybe we can go on to the next uh, uh, question from uh, Robert Brandenberger. In, in the chat, there was a question if Robert can, can ask the question. Yeah, this was a trivial point. So you wrote on your slides that the new metric uh, vanishes at the origin, but you said horizon. Yeah. Oh, did I? Sorry. Okay. Um, no, so, it, it's the new. 
so first of all, the, uh, that was maybe a, a typo, but... Um, well, I, I... Well, there are several new metrics, first of all. So the, um, the, this 2-2, two, two, what I call 2-2, two, two, and uh, if you change the notation to minus 2-2, two, two, um, family is, is it, they're both going, it, it's going like R to the, the R squared in both the time and space space uh, components for that that type of of uh, uh, Lichner, be, uh, not Lichner, but, yeah, of, of initial behavior at the origin. That's the family which vanish where the metric vanishes, and that's what I meant. Okay, thanks. So if I if I wrote that somewhere, I'm not quite sure which slide. To, no, I no, you. I think you misspoke. Oh, you, I, you said you said vanishing at the horizon. Well, of course, at a horizon, uh, of course, um, the time part of the metric does vanish because that's the definition of the horizon. And then the, the, then you write A is the spatial part is one over F and then you find it vanishes there too, right? This, these are in short shield co coordinates, of course, that's a coordinate singularity, but uh, just to identify the horizon. Um, so if I misspoke, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, la the last question from Anupam, there is a question from you. Uh, so first of all, thanks, Kelly. It's very nice talk. So I have just a couple of questions. So when you say that you have a non, uh, I mean, your, your Krishman is uh, finite uh, in the non-singular solution which you obtain. Um, so essentially, you have a conformal core, if I understand. But then how do you get the wormhole solution? So my question is, uh, I mean, which solutions are physical and which are not? How do you decide? Ah, what's physical in this theory? That's a good question. Well, so let's see. Um, I didn't quite understand what you were set up. In your, the, the, what I call the wormhole was just, we're just looking, look, we're just sort of explorers here. I don't know what's physical about this whole theory at all, but um, we're looking to see what solutions there are. And um, for the wormhole solutions, we start at least at infinity on our side and look for, and so that was just an expansion of around, around a, a crossing point, a, a, a horizon-like crossing point, except if you want to, it's easier maybe just to go back to that, where, uh, let's, let's see, the, um, here we are, uh, nope, here we are. So remember the B was the time-time component. If F is vanishing, but B is still not vanishing, and it's still positive, then you, that's all we did was just expand around that, okay? So it has this structure and then you can change coordinates and you can see you can go through in the new coordinate row to another side. Now this nice behavior, which is um, Z2 symmetric is rather special. That means that it, of course it's Z2 symmetric. If you start from asymptotic flatness at infinity, you come into this crossing point, you go into another universe and you'll go out to asymptotic flatness on the other side. There are also non Z2 symmetric solutions, which uh, come through will cross through a similar sort of wormhole and will go out to something that is not asymptotically flat on the other side. So there are, there are sort of asymmetrical wormholes too. And if you're just doing numerical calculations, that's when I showed these, these regions, they include all types, right? That's just, that's just matching behaviors uh, at, uh, I mean, so this is the characteristic of what we call a wormhole is this behavior in terms of the F functions and and the B functions, right? They're not, it's not in fact a horizon because they should vanish together. But um, so if B is still non-zero, you have solutions that behave like this and indeed one finds them numerically as well. So I don't know if I addressed your question uh, okay. the way you wanted. Maybe, maybe yeah. later. Thanks. Oh, okay, okay. I think, I think we have to move to the next uh, talk because we are already almost 20 minutes uh, late on the schedule. So um, 